Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you are having as good a weather as we have in Minnesota. We're in the 60s and sunny, so that is a good thing in Minnesota. Hope that you are all doing well. We'll get started here. 5Q breakdown last week was all information about uh, about what went wrong in the last minute of a meeting. Over $500,000 that was a lay down if done right. Gone with the wind. Let's learn from the mistakes. So it's like anything, whether it's football, baseball, or closing a deal, if you're perfect throughout the whole entire game and then make a mistake in the last two minutes, what happens, guys? What happens? Yeah, you lose. So, and this was a this was a <laughs> unforced error. This was an unforced error. So it's something you would never, ever, ever have to worry about. So please, please, please um, listen to that breakdown and never do the unforced error that happened on that particular, because that's a lot of moolah to walk away from because of an unforced error. So I want to talk a little bit, you hear me talk about this regularly, but this is a great website. I look at it every single morning, and there's a reason for that. We've talked about the Cape Schiller uh, uh, measurement um, quite a bit, uh, and if you go to Guru Focus, just type in Cape Schiller or Schiller Cape and Guru Focus, and you can look at this every single day. And here's why it's important. Um, the Schiller PE is 30.4, and this guy's not out to lunch here because he gives you some great information. He's saying the Schiller PE is 18.4% higher than the recent 20-year average. So he's even giving us the benefit of the doubt saying, yeah, because uh, uh, Schiller basically looks at what's happened for the last, um, you know, for forever. And if you look at the Schiller PE ratio, you see, um, well, actually, this guy only goes back 20 years, but if you go back to 100 years, we're way, 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 way over the Cape Schiller. So this guy is reasonable saying, well, we're not going to look at the 100-year Cape Schiller. Let's say, things, let's say that we have a quote-unquote new normal for the Cape Schiller. Let's look at the last 20 years. But even with the last 20 years, the, the average is 25.6. We're at 30.4. That's 18% higher. Now, this is the most important um, part of, of, I think, this. If I can get here and see what I'm doing. Oh, there it is. Oh, great. That's why. Just a second here. I need a highlighter, not a pen. This is the important thing right here. Implied future return, then, if we're this much higher than the PE, the KPE, or the 10 year uh, uh, trailing average, this is what we should look at for rates of return over the next 10 years. So, why, guys? Why would we look at this as being the the implied future return of only 1.7% a year? Now, here's the thing. Back down here in the spring when we had the market crash, guess what the implied rate of return was? Any guess on? Well, it's saying that... It's saying that um, what this is, do you know what the the Cape Schiller is? It's looking at the last 10 years average, or the moving average for the, P, uh, the PE, okay? So if we're this much higher, that means what's got to happen? It means all the, the, a ton, a ton of future return has already been put into the market. A, a ton of future returns already been put in the market. So there is, it's got to go up a lot just to get back to normal. You're right. So a reversion to mean. So this is not a great, would you want to put money into the stock market for an average rate of return of 1.7% for the next 10 years? No. So now back here, back here when the market fell 30%, then your rate of return was about 9% on average for the next 10 years. So right now, do you want, if you can get your clients uh, moved out without tax ramifications from stocks, is that a good thing or a bad thing to do to sit on the sideline and wait for something to happen again? Does that make sense? So yeah, here's the case. Now this is the, goes all the way back to uh, uh, 100 years or more. So you can see the, this previous slide here is only the, talking about the last 20 years. So he's just saying, 
hey, you know what? Let's just look at these. Let's just look at from this point forward. But as compared to historically, where's the PE? I mean, when have we ever been this high before? One time and one time only, which is when? 2000. So it's not the time you want to be into the market. <laughs> not even. Not even close. I got to get out of this stupid, uh, here we go, turn that off. Okay. So unfortunately, history isn't on our side when it comes to the high valuations. With a CAPE ratio of above 30, the likely of a 15-year returns are going to be between negative 1% per year and 4%. Even 4% for the next 15 years, is that a good thing to be looking at for the next uh, 15 years? Or would it make more sense to sit on the sideline and wait for a good time to enter the market? Which would be better? Okay. Guys, let me ask you a question. Even if you're sitting in the sidelines in an FIA, if the market falls 30 or 40%, which is going to at some point during the next, uh, um, uh, well, we don't know when it's going to happen, but I, I have a feeling of when it's going to happen. But um, yeah, Gerard says 4% is better than zero in an FIA. So, would we, so Gerard, are you saying that you'd get 4% in an FIA or you get zero in an FIA? So Gerard said 4% is better than zero in an FIA. So help me understand. Are you saying you get 4% in an FIA or you get zero in an FIA? Well, uh, Gerard, I think you're, uh, I, I understand your point, but here's the thing, guys. Why could you get a 4% in an FIA over the next 15 years? Ah, Nick's got it. Good job, Nick. When they say the market's going to only return 1.7% or somewhere between negative 1% and 4% a year, does that mean it's going to make 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2% over the next 15 years? No. It means it's going to do what to make that? It's going to go up and it's going to go down. And what's the great thing about an FIA? It automatically buys low, automatically sells Hi, why did FIAs beat the pants off of the S&P 500 between 2000 and 2015 for that 15 year period? Why didn't FIA beat the pants off of, because of the resets, right Jeannie? Because of the resets. So I'd agree with you, Gerard, you get a 4% on FIA over the next 15 years as compared to the market simply because you're capturing, you're buying low automatically, you're selling high automatically. Gosh darn it. How do I turn this off, Missy? There we go. If you just, no? hit, escape, uh, just hit escape on your ah, keyboard. And I help think me. That will... Oh, okay. Can you just hit escape on ah, your keyboard? That's what did it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and remember, uh, yeah, and it works now. So here's, remember, this is how the market works, right? So how much did, they, did you make if you're in the market from 19, 1898 to uh, 1921? For 22 years, how much did you make? Nothing. But then, holy cow, you average 21% a year for eight years. And what do human beings have, long memories or short memories? And then for 25 years, you made nothing. Guys, what's the average? What is the average retirement? If you didn't, if you made nothing for 22 years, nothing for 25 years, nothing for 17 years, nothing for 12 years, what's that going to do to a retirement? Destroy it. Destroy it. Now, the great thing is, look at, if you were, the 22 years of zero, if you were an FIA, did you do okay? If you were an FIA, did you do okay? If you were an FIA, did you do okay? If you were an FIA, did you do okay? Yeah. So, would I be 50-50 in an FIA right now, or would I be more than 50-50 in an FIA right now? You know what I'd be, and, and, and that's what I am. So for me, this is likely, uh, this is the gentleman who wrote this article uh, down at Seeking Alpha. For me, this is likely to become another investing tragedy. Given the boom in investing applications, more and more people that don't understand what investing is 
put their money into vehicles they don't understand because those that went before them made money. So all these people in the Robin Hood app, all these dough heads during COVID sitting in their basement trading, they've only seen what from the 30% the downturn in the spring to current? What have they seen? And they think they're a friggin' what? Because they're buying, and they're not even buying stock. What are they doing, guys? They're buying options. And they think they're friggin' geniuses. Now, they would be geniuses if they did what? They would be geniuses if they did what? Just like when you win at the craps table and you, and you, put, you lay down $1,000, you, you win $10,000, you are a genius if you do what? Yeah, walk away. <laughs> but they're, they're, it, it's like anything like this. You know, as soon as a 20-year-old who's never invested in the marketplace thinks he's a stock market genius, as soon as the cab driver is giving you stock tips, you need to what? Be on the sidelines. Now, a great thing about FIA is, you know what? You make money when the market's, uh, uh, you don't lose money when the market's down, you make money when the market's up. This is something that's going to be a lot better for a retiree. Maybe not for a 20-year-old, because a 20-year-old has how many years? A 20-year-old has 40 years before they retire. A 20-year-old has 40 years before they retire. A 20-year-old has 40 years before they retire. But you know what? Does a retiree have 22 years of zero to wait to, with a zero, 25 years of zero to wait, 17 years of zero to wait, 12 years of zero to wait? Guys, how powerful is this chart to show clients? <laughs> would they get it then? You're darn them tootin' they would. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about selling. Now, has anybody heard of spin selling before? So it's pretty hot, uh, has been for the last 20 years, a pretty hot uh, 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 theory of selling. If you haven't heard of it, that's okay, because spin selling is based on the, the uh, best validated sales method available today, developed from research and studies of 35,000 sales calls used by the top sales forces across the world. But who were they selling? To? Yeah, very good, Kevin. Kevin, you got it, man. Business to business. It's business to bill, business to selling. Is that the exact same thing as business to consumer selling, guys? No, it's quite a bit different. That's why there's, if you look at marketing, there's different business to business and business to consumer marketing. If you look at selling, there's different business to business, business to consumer selling. There, there are different mentalities. So spin selling, based on 12 years of research, 35,000 calls, spin selling is sales strategy from Neil Rackman's 1988 classic book, Spin Selling. Now it's been updated about every decade. They updated, updated, updated. In his book, Rackham uh, argues that in order to win larger consultative deals, salespeople must abandon traditional sales techniques in order to build value as a trusted advisor. So this is still used by an awful lot of companies like IBM, uh, UPS, et cetera, because it, it's, it's still a valid um, uh, mentality or psychology of selling. So we're going to walk through it. So here's, here's what they look at it with spin selling. And we want to see how much of this actually are we doing with the consumer to validate it. So step one, ask a situation question. These are questions which ask for background information or facts. For example, how would you describe your current situation? Step two, ask a problem-based question. These are questions which ask about the prospect's problems, difficulties, dissatisfactions. An example would be, how often does that happen? Do we do these two steps, guys? Do we do, the, very good, Steve. Do we do these steps? No, we don't do these steps. Why? Because if you ask, do we want to work with people with money, guys? Do you want to work with people with money? Yeah. So if you ask somebody with money, are they, if they have money, you know, out of COVID, are they eating when they going out to eat when they want? Are they going on vacation when they want? Are they are they um, uh, uh, buying the cars that they want? Yeah, they are. So when you ask them what kind of problems they have, Jeff, what kind of problems do they say they have? No, oh, they're going to say they don't have any problems. If you ask them to describe their current situation, they're going to tell you, well, we're doing pretty good. I mean, we're just wondering if we could do a little bit better. I mean, we're just here to see. <laughs> But otherwise, we're fine. And when they say a little bit better, how much change will they make for that little bit better? Or do they want you to wave the magic wand? None. They don't want to make any changes. They just want you to wave the magic wand. <laughs> exactly. So we don't follow these. Now, the good thing is, is question, question. So he does recommend asking questions. 
Then number step three, ask an implication question. These are questions which ask about the problem's consequences. Now do we do this, guys? Do we do this? Ask questions about how that would affect them or the consequences or impacts. How is that a problem? In fact, yes, that's all we do. We say, we say we, you know, that's the whole 21-point checklist is about what? Consequences. If we don't take care of this, what's going to happen? All right? Step four, ask a, a need payoff question. These are questions which ask about the value, importance, or usefulness of the solutions. An example would be, if this problem was solved, what would be the benefit to your company? Now, we do do that in a sideways. Is that if, if Our question is, if you leave your current advisor, what are you going to get? And if they leave their current advisor, what are they going to get, guys? Or what are they going to avoid? If you do the 21-point checklist correctly, what are they going to avoid by leaving their current advisor? Peace of mind. If you take your money from somebody who's been taking advantage of you, yeah, because they're going to stop getting ripped off. And once all these questions are asked, it's time to move on to the sale of your product or service. But there's lots of things in here. And again, we said it's business to business. We're going to do business to consumer. Does it, is there anything that we can learn from this? So let's, let's take a look at this. Spin selling summary. To get full impact of Rackham's advice, we recommend you read the entire book. Again, this is not a book I'd recommend you guys read because it's more business to business. But I think that there are some tidbits in here that we can learn from. So sales behavior and success. Closing is less important than most salespeople managers think. Do we agree with that, guys, at, at 5Q? When I was, when I was selling, and I, the first year I got in front of 300 people, I got in front of 300 people, got in front of $34 million in investable assets, movable assets, did 101 case analysis. Was I a good closer, guys? No. Because I only moved 800,000 of that. It's not about closing. Is motivational interviewing about closing? Do we ever close? What's, a, what's our hard pressure sale? Okay, did we cover a lot of things today? Obviously, so here's what I'd recommend. Let's, let's, give you t let's schedule an appointment a week out. We'll give time for the dust to settle. Give, uh, give you time to come up with some great questions. We'll get together next time. We'll walk through your questions. Then we just move forward at your pace. How does that sound, Mr. Client? Is that a close, guys? Or what am I letting happen? Who's pushing the close at that point? If you do this, those of you that have done the 21-point checklist properly, who's, who's pushing the close? They're saying, I want to move my money now. I want to move my money now. I want to move my money now. How much easier is it? Or you let them say, I want my mo to move my money now, then you saying, do you see any reason why we shouldn't move forward right now? Should you ever ask that question? Should we, do you see any reason that we should move, shouldn't move forward right now? No, 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 no. Let them do it. Yeah. So number two here, questioning is more important than most salespeople managers think. Do we agree with that? Heck yeah. The ratio of closed-ended questions, open-ended questions doesn't predict selling success. Do we agree with that? The ratio, very good, Ben. The ratio of closed-ended questions to open-ended questions does not predict selling success. Good job, Nick. Good job, Ben. Ah, you guys all got it. No, we do not agree with that. How many closed-ended questions do we want to ask? None. Why? Because what is a yes worth? What is a yes worth? Nothing. So these guys got it all wrong there. Because a yes can mean, I don't agree with you, but I don't want an argument. A yes could mean, I don't know what the heck you're saying, but I don't want to look stupid. Yes could mean, um, um, could mean, uh, I've not been listening to you, but I'm just saying you yes, 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 we go along. Or yes could actually mean yes. But even if yes actually means yes, is that worth anything? No. Just like we've talked about where if I show you how to tie a knot, I say, here's how you tie a bowline. You go through here, you make a loop, go around once, through it, and then make another loop, go through it again. Got that? And in your mind, you're like, oh, that's simple. That's easy. So I throw the rope at you, walk out the room, and then get, and say, tie a bowline while I'm gone. And then you look at the rope and what happens? It made sense when I did it. It made total sense when I did it. But then once I leave the room, you're like, crap, how did you do that again? If I want you to really 
lock in the knowledge there. I'm going to say, hey, okay, what are we going to do with the rope here? We're going to make a loop. Yeah, we're going to make a loop, and then what do we do with it? Well, we thread it through. Yep, and then what do we do? Ah, oh, shoot, what do we, I forget. Well, do we go through? Is there any else place to thread it through? Or do we got to make another loop? We got to make another loop. Oh, we got to make another loop. Boom. So they talk themselves into it. So that's why we do not agree with this closed end. And actually, guys, do you think if you're selling a business to business, would it be better our way or spin selling's way? Our way or spin spell selling's way? Where they, they think closed ended questions are good. Our way. Human nature is if nobody wants to be stupid. Everybody always wants to be right. So you let them close for you. Great reps, now I, do we agree with this? Great reps focus on preventing, not handling objections. Do we agree with that? Yes, we do, absolutely. That's why we have the scripts. So again, what, we agree with about three quarters of what's happening here. Section two, obtaining commitment, closing sale. Successful closing depends on getting the right commitment. So what kind of commitments do we get throughout the, the, our process? What's the big commitment we get through our process constantly, 21 times? If you do the process properly, except for us, uh, you're going to get about 19 or more commitments. And what are the commitments? My guy is taking advantage of, very good, Steve. My guy is taking advantage of me. Is that a commitment, guys? Yeah, that's right, Mark. My advisor is bad. Why is that a commitment? Well, here's the nice thing. Here's the nice thing. If you do this right, how good do you have to be? So let's say Jeff and I are on, on a, uh, the Queen Mary. We're, we're, we're uh, sailing across the ocean. And I decide, you know, we're playing, I play cards with Jeff at a table for other guys. And about halfway through, I'm sick of Jeff because he's always talking about this and talking about that. I'm sick and tired of talking. And I, just hearing him speak, he's like fingernails on a chalkboard. I have decided I hate Jeff. So I don't go to the card game anymore. Now, the ship goes down. The ship goes down. I'm in 40 degree water. I know I've got about a half hour before I die of hypothermia, Jeff rose by in a book, in a book, <laughs> Jeff rose by in a boat and says, reaches out to me to take, to, to offer a, a lift into the boat. Now I hate Jeff. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I don't take his hand. That's right. I'm going to get in the boat, Gerard. I'm going to get in the boat. See, that's the great thing. If you do the 21-point checklist appropriately, Jeff, if you do the 21-point checklist appropriately, how, how worried do you have to be, Jeff, about um, uh, whether the, you've done a fantastic job of presenting great uh, uh, products to the, to the client and that they love you? You don't have to be worried about it. I mean, at the end of the day, they're leaving as much, if not more, to get away from their guy as they are about what you and you have to offer um what you and you what you have to offer is important but it's it's really yeah, if you're running down the street jeff you're running down the street and somebody's sh shooting at you that's right because like, if you're running down the street and somebody's shooting at you and a, a car pulls next to you and opens door says get in what are you going to do i'm going to get worry in. about if it's a bad guy in there no i'm getting in <laughs> <laughs> yeah so but uh, most guys, Jeff, what, most guys, at least guys that aren't trained with 5Q, what are they worried about? About um, killing the other guy or about showing what, how trustworthy and smart they are? Uh, showing how trustworthy and smart they are, which you can't win that. It's a catch-22. They're not, they're not, they don't, they don't have any way to know whether you're trust, trustworthy or smart. You say you are, and, and they kind of want to believe you, but there's no way to prove that. You can only prove that if they move to you, but they're not going to move to you unless you prove it, if that's the track that you're going to run on. What you have to realize is that's not a successful track to run on. Because how many successful advisors would they be? Everybody. How how smart are most advisors? How many good ideas do most advisors have? How trust? Yeah, they all are. <laughs> so, so every time a client ran into another advisor, guess what they do? It hops gets from one to another to another. No, they're not going to do that. They're not going to do that. Thanks, Jeff. So number two here, reps must determine their call objective in advance. 
What's our one and only call objective at the 21 point checklist to get them to move? What is our one and only call objective? Get them to say their advisor is bad. That's all, that's our only objective. We're gonna say it or they're gonna say it? They're going to say it, that's our only objective. If you are successful at getting the client to say that their guy is taking advantage of them, withholding information to put line his own pockets and take money out of your pockets, withholding information to do that, and they say that 19 times, how many people are gonna move? Who would stay with their advisor at that point? Now, I got 99% I got and I got most. Guys, if they say that 19 times that their guy's taking advantage of them, it's withholding information to line his own pockets and not <laughs> and take money out of yours, is it going to be 99% or is it going to be most or is it going to be what? Yeah, all. If they don't move their money after a 21 point checklist and Jeff, you listen to the tape, what are you gonna hear? Or what are you not gonna hear? Well, you're not gonna hear them attack, you're not gonna hear them getting them to realize the advisor is taking advantage of them. In the last 20 years that you and I have been listening to tapes, if the guy even gets a client to say 10 times, not 19 times, but 10 times, that their advisor is withholding information that's putting the client in a worse position and them and the, and the advisor in a better position. How many people have not moved, Jeff? Oh, they've all moved. Yeah. It's not mo and, and not even if you do it 19 times. I'm shooting for 19 times, but 10 times even. Make sense? There are four potential outcomes for every sale. Order, advance the sale, continuation of the sale, or no sale, I guess I'd agree with that. Number th section three, implicit needs are statements about problems, issues, and areas of dissatisfaction. What's our pro problem with the people we wanna get in front of? These people that are, have money, do they think they have problems? Do they think they have issues or do they have areas of dissatisfaction? The people we wanna get in front of, no. So that doesn't work for us. Explicit needs are specific features or functions. So do we, uh, are we even worried about features or functions, guys? No. In larger sales, explicit needs are strong buying signals. See, the only, there, well, I guess there is one explicit need that we, we go through. What's, is, and it's nothing to do with features or functions. What's the explicit need, again, that we need the client to figure out? That's right, I can't trust my guy anymore. I need a new advisor. And again, guys, remember, uh, is everybody the same difficulty in selling? No, we have some people who you get in front of and they're one in difficulty because you're at the right place at the right time. They just moved to town. Their guy just retired or died. Uh, they, just re they just retired and don't know what to do with the 401k. That's the one. And then you have the 10. They're difficult people to sell. So do you have to be perfect at the 21 point checklist? No, but the better you get, what happens? The better you get, the more, the, the, uh, uh, the more likely you're gonna sell them regardless of the difficulty. And guys, who are these people? Who are the hard people? The people with 50 grand or the people with 3 million? They're the people with 3 million. And here's the thing, how many 50 grand people do you need to sell to, to make, make, for the one, make up for the one $3 million guy that because you hadn't prepared properly with the scripts, et cetera, you missed? Yeah, tons. So you don't have to be at a 10, but you need to constantly progressing towards, because the unfortunate thing about the 20, 21 point checklist is it's so powerful, some people will get to a five and then guess what happens? They say, man, I'm closing people, I'm closing people, closing people. And then they call Jeff or they call me and say, geez, you know, I had this guy at 2.5 million and I thought I was doing a good job, but I didn't move him. Everybody's been moving for the last three months, but this guy with 2.5 didn't move. It's because they got to a five and what do they do, guys? They were closing way more. They were closing five times more people than they'd closed before. 
So they thought they'd what? I got this thing locked in. What happened to their 15-minute drills? What happened to their pursuit of mastering the scripts? They stopped. And that's okay because if, if we're closing five times more people than we did before, is that a good thing? Yeah, that's a great thing. Maybe that's all you want. But, man, it certainly is a kick in the stomach when you lose that $2.5 million guy. Because even what's, how many $500,000 people does it take to, to, to make up for one $2.5 million guy? And we're happy with a $500,000 close. But, man, when we're walking away from a 2.5 because we got lazy, we have to work five times harder, don't we? Just get a little bit better and never – are we ever good enough? The true athletes out there, do they ever think they're good enough? The true actors out there, do they ever think they're good enough? What do true uh, 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 people – what do people who are awesome in what they do continually do? They keep working at it to get better. Have you seen LeBron James work out and what he does to stay to, – to, does, does he does he um, sit on his um, laurels? How about uh, Stephen Curry? Does he sit on his laurels? No, they're constantly practicing. Section four, salespeople who close at high rates tend to ask the same types of questions in the same order. Aha, do we do that, guys? Do we do that? Yes. See, we have 60,000 tapes of people asking the same questions in the same order. And guess what happens when you ask the same questions in the same order when there's 60,000 people in front of you who've done that? You succeed. There are four main question types, situation, problem, implication, uh, need payoff. Here's the great thing. Do you guys need to worry about the types of questions or have we given you the questions to ask? Have other advisors in front of you ask those same questions 60,000 times in the same order? So you don't even need to worry about that. Each question type plays a different role in moving the buyer forward. Give benefits in major sales. Features benefits are the most common way to pitch a product or service. Advantages are less effective in the sales process. Features are more important to users than decision makers. Benefits, so this is the whole feature advantage benefit motive. Uh, or, um, uh, do we worry about features, advantage, and benefits, guys? No. We're all about the motive. How good, Jeff, do you have to be at an FIA presentation when they decided they don't trust their guy and need to move the money? You don't have to be that good. It just has to make some sense. Because, um, again, their their main motivation is to get away from that guy. And at the 21-point checklist, have they validated how much they want in safe versus equities? Yeah, um, they, ha they should have. I, I know that's a weakness in when I listen to tapes, but yes, in theory, they would have. And have they discovered what, how, how bonds can be terrible things to be in right now? Yeah, that's part of the uh, FIA presentation. You've done the 21 point checklist, right? Yes, the interest rate volatility. Well, and it's also part of the what? Uh, interest rate volatility, yeah. the 21 point checklist. So, guys, right. So, how good do you have to be at the FIA presentation if you've done a great job at the 21? Not very good at all. Preventing objections. Objections are usually created by a salesperson, not the buyer. Do you think I would agree with that, guys? Yeah, by not following the script or adding to the script. The more advantages you present, the more objections you receive. Well, I'd, I'd agree with that. Develop needs before you offer benefits to, uh, to avoid unnecessary objections. And again, what's the need we develop? I don't trust my guy. I need to get my money away from him as quickly as possible. If that's their mindset, do you have to worry about features, advantages, and benefits? No. Don't use conventional openings, providing benefits or relating prospects into personal interest. Guys, do we believe in this? Don't use conventional openings, providing benefits or relating to the prospect's personal interest. Get down to business quickly and establish your purpose. And Jeff, you've done this many, many times. Why do we not want to 
Uh, it's worth establishing again, though. Why do we not want to do the, the proverbial develop rapport by finding personal histories that we share? Why do we not want to do that? What does the research tell us? The research says that's an indicator of fraud. Um, so uh, the two indicators of fraud are uh, the person will be overly familiar. They'll try and act like they've known you for a long time, like they're your friend, even though this is the first time you've actually met them. And then the other one is refusal to answer questions. You ask a question and it sounds like an answer, but it's not really an answer. That's that's exactly right. So, you know, the analogy I give is this: is when I'm with a doctor, do I want him to be? I'm I'm in a gown, with my ass hanging out the backside. Do I want to get him asking about whether I fish or what college I went to or uh, whether I'm a aficionado of Corvettes or what? Do I want him talking about that or do I want him to be polite, professional, and let me get the heck out of there and back in my clothes? Which one do I want? And when people are in front of you with their money, they're giving you personal information they wouldn't give to anybody else, they're sitting there in that hospital gown on with nothing underneath. They want you to be kind. They want you to be courteous. They want you to be professional. But when you start trying to, to say, oh, wow, you're, you're from the University of Minnesota, so am I, man. Oh, burr, 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 burr. Does that, when people do that to you guys, when you're buying a car, you're buying five thousand dollars worth of furniture or whatever it may be. When you're when they're doing that to you, does that make you feel like you're bonding with them, or does it make you feel like he's trying to take advantage of you when a salesman is doing that to you? Yeah, they're trying to sell you direct. Exactly. So don't do that. That's right, John. Eight. eight. Adopt one. Did you want to say something, Jeff? I didn't hear. No. So uh, adopt a principle of spin selling at a time of avoid getting overwhelmed. Practice them on a smaller accounts or existing customers first. The thing is, just do it. Should we wait till we're perfect at the 21-point checklist, guys? No. Just do it. Just do it, do it, do it. So this is what – this is based on uh, psychological research. Again, would you say spin selling <laughs> or, or the motivational interviewing mentality is going to have a higher – success rate. We agree with 75% of what they're saying, but if they, but if business to business people used our mentality, who would have more success? Motivational interviewing would, because nobody likes to be wrong. Everybody wants to be right, and our system is designed to let who be right, you or the client be right. Yeah, it lets them be right. And when they decided to move, they're going to move. Make sense? Is it okay if occasionally I um, uh, show you other, quote unquote, uh, uh, selling systems and how ours compares and why doing a lot of research on finding other selling systems is probably not in your best interest because most of them have, have flaws in them as compared to what you're doing? Is it okay if like once a quarter or once or twice a year I do that? Because I know that we're always thinking, oh, is there something better? Is there something better? Is there something better? Guys, there ain't nothing better than motivational interviewing. It's been around for 400 years. Blaise Pascal in, invented the, the 400 years ago the mentality that is nobody likes to be wrong. So the best way to persuade somebody is to ask questions to get them to explain to you why your point of view is right. And when they do that, how many objections do you have? None. This science that we're teaching you is 400 years old, and it's rhetorical questioning. The nice thing is, do you have to come up with your own questions, or have Jeff and I come up with the questions that have worked 60,000 times? Make sense? And the reason I'm saying this is we're going into the holiday season. I know a lot of people are not doing any marketing. We have light at the end of the tunnel for marketing, which means come January, we should all, you know, now that we've had our eight-month forced vacation, come January, we should be doing what? Come January, we should be doing what? Marketing. So between now and then, in the next two months, it's November 2nd, between now and January 1st, what should you be doing? Now that we've got light at the end of the tunnel of marketing, what should you be doing? 
Because I understand eight months, a lot of you haven't been practicing a lot of your scripts. I get it. If I was in your shoes, you know, if you're not seeing new people, if you're just going back to clients and referrals, you're probably not as sharp on the 21-point checklist as you could be. But you got two months now. How good should you be at the 21-point checklist come January 1st? Yes, 15-minute drills, Kevin, 21-point checklist. Please, please, please put it now. Should you promise yourself you're going to do it or you should do what? To make sure it happens, I sh what should happen? To make sure you're getting your 15-minute drill and you're getting great at the 21-point checklist, yes, put it in the calendar. So if Jeff or I ask or are talking to you and we say, hey, send us your calendar, that calendar should be what? If it's either it should be seeing people or it should have, I'm practicing the, the interest volatility script or I'm practicing the risk risk reward script or I'm practicing the, the medical power of attorney script. Put them in your calendar. Be awesome by January 1st so that come January 1st we can turn on the jets. Make sense? Sound like a plan? Awesome, awesome. You guys have a wonderful rest of the week, and we'll talk to you all next Monday. Thanks, everybody.